Oh, thank you. And um, what I thought I'd do was talk for about 35 minutes, hopefully 35 at the most, and leave room for the rest of the hour to do some back and forth with you guys, maybe an exercise. Certainly I have some questions for you and maybe you'll have some questions for me. Um, but what, I'd start, what I thought I'd start doing, first of all, do I sound good sound? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, let, yes. me just read, let me just read you this first part because I want to say it right and I don't want to add lib um, on this, which is the subtitle of this talk is Thinking Beyond Genre. And what I mean by that, and let me just read it, just a, a paragraph. I've come to believe that some book projects have a mind or a momentum of their own. We don't always know how they start, when they have started or where, or what form or forms they have taken or potential forms they might take until we're deep in the process. We seem to be always running behind trying to catch up. That in a sense, the final form or crystallized genre is only truly elucidated at the end, even if we have given the work temporary labels along the way. I wanna call these projects hybrid works and posit that they move in a realm beyond genre. I'm not gonna fight too hard for that. And if you have thoughts of clarifying edifying uh, nature at the end, I'm happy because this is a uh, really a talk in process. Last yesterday, many of you were there, Curtis Bauer's awesome talk um, yesterday, and, and, and I was joking to myself, and last year, um, he encouraged us, us, among other things, to declutter our imaginations and let things go. And he quoted, thank you, I wanna be done with you, which I definitely feel about 2020, as many of us do. It was, very, it was a very helpful uh, and generative talk, as uh, I'm not surprised with Curtis. Um, I'd add, though, thinking about this talk, um, he's going up endings and I'm going to beginnings, that we might benefit by investigating or interrogating or just kind of messing around with the clutter before we do away with it, that there might be clues in the fragments that will lead us to new projects. You never know what you got in a way. Um, Theodore Redke called it, straw for the fire. You'd keep lines in a journal and, and, and they might go into another poem or a piece of prose later. What I'd like to do is to begin by describing my first, a, a project of my own first, then talk about three other books um, through the lens in a sense of, uh, of a writer that I really enjoy, Jeff Dyer, um, and then come back to my own work and then we'll move out to discussion. Um, I'm gonna read you the poem and Glenn, I don't know if it's working, but if you go to that first slide, uh, you don't need to necessarily read it off the slide, but I'll, um, we'll start there. And the book is called The Beginner's Guide to a Head-On Collision. And uh, it came out in 2017. Um, this is the title piece. And the subtitle is um, A Memoir in Poems. So, but really it's a hybrid work. It's got prose, it's got, prose poems, it's got poetry. It had photo montages, but the press nixed it at the last minute. Um, but that was okay. But this poem is called, and I wrote it as prose actually, and then turned it into a uh, broken kind of free verse. Um, Beginner's Guide to a Head-on Collision. Whatever you do, don't see it coming. You're too busy doing your thing, driving to point A, point B, just driving, tunes blasting, smiling at loved ones. When the car drifts into your lane, don't see it, not at first. It takes a split second for the bullseye to be slipped on before you understand the simple equation of mass and, fo and force and oh shit, here it comes. Now the hard part's over. No, that's a lie. It gets harder each second from here on out. More importantly, sorry, it gets harder each second from here on out. Ignore the sound of the engines sizzling like a diner grill. No good letting your mind puzzle that one out. More importantly, why can't you get your feet out from under the dash, chest pressed into the wheel? What to do with that? Breathe, man, and keep breathing. And, they, and as they take your family away, one after the other, alive, breathing, as they pry you out of your seat like a splinter deep in, and keep breathing on the stretcher and in the helicopter. Don't stop breathing, you're doing fine. We're almost there. When I, as you can imagine, um, the 
the, the story of this accident is a true story. And it was uh, something that my family went through now going on eight years ago um, and or nine almost. And it was something that of course, just, you know, it was a head on collision with the, somebody who had died. It was uh, one of those bad luck scenarios in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, in the process of the first few months of recovery and doing PT and lots of surgeries and, and learning how to walk again, um, I started writing these kind of drugged up, dazed pieces that were kind of poems and kind of something else like journal entries. Um, and I didn't really know what they were, but when I, but when I, um, when I wrote that poem, I realized, oh, maybe I have, maybe there's a project here. And it took me, that was, I wrote that one about it six months out. When I first started trying to write about the accident and it was kind of masochistic on my part, um, I couldn't really do it. And I'm not surprised now, I'm not sure why I was trying, but um, I wrote these poems that were called Dear Virgo Poems. They're eight line things. And I'm gonna read you one quickly. And at the time they felt like failures of nerve. It felt like I wasn't really doing anything. Uh, I wasn't getting at the real subject matter of the accident. I'm a Virgo. And these are kind of um, bitter, self-directed, uh, astrological kind of fake horoscopes. Dear Virgo, it's not the first time you've been assassinated. You get shot all the time. Once you swilled a poison martini down to the twist before death brimmed your brain, plan, your brain pan with helicopter chop and adrenaline, wait long enough and resurrection comes back in style. Your moon though is in perpetual retrograde. Now's the time to act. As the book goes along those poems, as, as I was writing them over time, they got nicer, but at first they were really kind of uh, self uh, directed, kind of shaming, uh, angry. And it took me a while, and not until I wrote that Beginner's Guide poem, to realize that there were these two voices speaking, or more than two voices, a kind of a split of consciousness. And that's when I realized that maybe I had something, a project that I needed to um, explore. I wrote um, as many poems as I could over a six month period. Uh, I didn't really call them poems, they were paragraphs. Some of them became Dear Virgo, some of them became poems, and I realized about a year in that I had a, a, a collection, a weave of different forms. I was making them photo montages and those were in there too. Um, and there was a, I'm not gonna read it here, but the, there's a piece changes um, about a year and a half out through the process. The book describes about a four year period. I began to write about my experiences out in the world, uh, my encounters with people, because I was really trying to, um, get back into the world. I had really become a hermit and I had struggled with PTSD and it, it was hard for me to get out there. And so this piece changes, describes driving along and, and, and almost running over this guy who had a, a raccoon on a pole as he was crossing the road. But really the, and then I saw another person on that same drive as I was driving, but really what I was writing about was beginning to see that I needed to um, change myself and, and change myself through a transformation of awareness. I needed to get more engaged in my own life. Um, and so four or five years into this process, I showed it to the, my editor at Red Hen Press and she, she said she liked it a lot. And she said, you know, you might want to, I'd written an essay, a personal essay. She said, why don't you break that apart and put that into the book too? And so the book has four sections of an essay kind of, kind of pulled throughout the piece. And, um, and then that kind of created the book. And so I'm just basically trying to describe to you the book and the process that I came to kind of back, you know, backhandedly in a way, um, life handed me a project in a way. And I, I wouldn't recommend getting in a major car wreck, but I think we all know that there are times when things happen where your subject matter is kind of given to you um, and you don't know what to do with it. And so you, you do what you can. And what you find is what I found was that the form, the many forms you use are an advantage that you come to you come to it in a mosaic or you come to it in a collage and that in this case being fractured and putting myself back together uh, that that uh, it wasn't just a metaphor it really was a piecing together. Um, so there's that and then if we go to the next slide if you don't mind I'd like to show you guys um, briefly and talk about briefly three books that I think that are um, major hybrid works. Um, and 
One of them is Dikti by Teresa Ha Kyung Cha. Uh, one is Citizen, an American lyric by Claudia Rankin. And one is Draw Your Weapons by Sarah Centiles. And I'll have all that information at the end of the talk. I want to look at them through the lens of some of the things that this writer, Jeff Dyer, says about his own work. I think he's a great hybrid writer as well. But he, um, he doesn't use other, he does, isn't as experimental as the other three writers that I'm going to show you. But I think he really understands um, some of the ways that uh, approaching things from a hybrid model can really uh, deepen. Uh, it's a like fused work, I call it. I almost think of it as like he fuses things together. Um, people always say about him, he's genre defying, um, as if it was like, you know, he was doing some kind of circus act. Um, so, what I'll do is look at th right now three different, what I think th three other ways that people maybe or you might enter into a hybrid project. Um, and this first one is through what I call through not knowing or through experimentation and or, and or pushing against dominant forms. And if you look at that, um, the, the bottom of the, well, actually, let me just give you a quick read of it. The very first paragraph, I don't know if you read Jeff Dyer, but he's funny, he's a funny writer. When I began this book, I was unsure of the form it should take. This was a great advantage since it meant I had to improve. And so from the start, the writing was animated by the defining characteristic of its subject. And that subject is jazz. He was an, not a jazz expert, somebody who just loved the music and he loved the stories and he wanted to write about the major figures. So he started to look at photographs and do research on these guys and getting the stories. And he began to, to as you read below, he began to essentially combine criticism and fiction. He writes, um, almost halfway down that second paragraph, as I invented dialogue and action, so what was emerging came more and more to resemble fiction. At the same time though, these scenes were still intended as commentary, either on a piece of music or on the particular qualities of a musician. What follows then is a, as much imaginative criticism as fiction. So here I, I see somebody experimenting and creating essentially a new form and saying, I'm not gonna write a typical book about jazz and this is not straight fiction. I'm going to do a kind of combination and only because it's the best way I can do it. It's the only way I can do it. Okay. Um, I don't know. The slides are looking good. I, I think we, I don't know if you've solved that blue screen thing. We'll see. I want to do the next slide. Yay. How many folks have read this book? Anybody read, um, Tick T, I can't see everybody at once, but I see one hand up. Anybody else? No, uh, it's, it's worth searching out. It's a, a seminal work and it's an avant-garde experimental work. Um, let me read something to you. And if you, if you don't mind, Glenn, just kind of go through slowly the three ne next three slides and then kind of back up to, the, to this one again, if that's okay. Glenn is saving my butt here. That's my tech guy. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to read you something that uh, uh, the writer Mayuk Sen, and I hope I'm saying that right, uh, from The Nation, wrote about this book the, in an essay called A Kind of Blueprint, The Radical Vision of Teresa Ha Kyung Cha's Dikti. In 1980, when she was 29, the South Korean-born artist and poet Teresa Ha Kyung Cha moved from the Bay Area to New York. She hated the city. After two years there, she wrote that achieving success would require her to accept the dregs of morals, money, parasitic existence. To her, the thought of making that ethical bargain was in all honesty, disgusting. The release of her experimental novel, Dicti, that fall, gave Cha reason to hope. Published by Tanum Press, the book offered fragment portraits of mythological and historical women, the Greek goddesses Demeter and per Persephone, Joan of Arc, the Korean revolutionary Yu Guan Song, um, spelled differently here, but um, and also Cha's mother. And I don't know if the next slide, I think you get a picture of Cha's mother as well as herself. Some pages are in French, some are in English, a few are blank. There are occasional anatomical drawings of the human larynx and vocal cords. There's some calligraphy. Um, she quotes uh, letters from uh, in the historical record. Um, it's a, it's a real uh, collage of forms and, and language and text. 
Um, it's, it's thick, it's hard to decipher at times, it's hard to enter into, but if you hang with it, you really are getting um, what basically, let me see here. Now, I, I'm just gonna describe it myself, but, but essentially you're getting a, not a straight autobiography and you're not getting straight history and it certainly doesn't feel like a straight novel, you're getting a look at um, self through all these prisms and through all, historically you're looking at, she looks at herself in relation to her mother, she looks at her mother in relation to this revolutionary figure before, then Joan of Arc, she's looking at ancient myths. She's, as you can see here, I've underlined, she's describing essentially becoming an American citizen and the difficulty and kind of um, the, just the, the, pain of it in a way. I have documents, documents, proof, evidence, photographs, signature. One day you raise the right hand and you were an American. They give you an American passport, United States of America. Somewhere someone, someone has taken my identity and replaced it with their photograph. So the photographs become this incredible uh, document, uh, documentation of, of, of her transformation. It's, it's a beautiful book. I won't say much more because I end up just talking in circles about it. But as you can see, um, you want to go to the last one there too? Is there one more? Oh, that is the last one. That is the last one. Yeah, anyway, if anybody has anything they want to jump in and ask as we're going or say, please do. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, is it Janie? Uh, you, you said that you'd read it. Do you have any kind of insights into it that I'm kind of glossing over? Um, there's a whole um, <clears throat> body of books <clears throat> that have come after this by some Korean American writers. Um, yep. And I found reading them together to be really enriching and rewarding and confusing and exciting. Um, Dictee is a difficult read. It is. Um, but it's difficult in some ways, like walking through an art museum can be difficult. If you're not in the right headspace, and if you can't take the time, if you can't look at the placards, if you can't step closer, step back, um, trust this writer, it's going to be a really rough ride. But boy, was it worth spending time with. That's a very great well, choice. That's a great way to put it. Um, that sense that you're, it's really, you're, you're almost going through a, a gallery here and it's, and it's not, a, it's not the normal read. You have to kind of make associative leaps. You have to kind of go back and turn the page and you have to kind of yeah, so beautifully said, thank you. Um, it's, worth, it's worth exploring. I think it's a, a book that has affected um, a lot of writers, a Korean and Korean American writers, but also just, I, I think as a feminist text, it's been really inspirational. Uh, as, a, as a collage book, it's been, uh, I think, a powerful influence. It certainly was on me when I first came across that. I had no idea what it was. Um, well, let's go to the next slide. And this is another, another kind of lens of, of through Jeff Dyer, I think another way that people will turn to work, the, the, I see um, Cha is really kind of trying to break dominant forms and, and do something that, that is, allows her to be fully herself when she feels like there's this assistant that's not gonna let her be that, um, to express herself the way she needs to. I think another way to do it, another reason for hybrid works is, is that you, you take inspiration from other texts and, you, and other voices you let them in, not just in the process, but you also let those voices and images and texts come into your work. Um, and even more so, you collaborate with other artists. Um, and so your book, the book isn't just your book, it's, a, it's your voice shared with other voices, other artists. And I wanna look at um, Citizen um, by Claudia Rankin in, in, through that lens, but I just wanna read you a quick little bit of, of this book uh, the intro to this book, Wrestling with D.H. Lawrence, actually the full title is Out of Sheer Rage. And he says here at the, um, halfway down, I can remember, no, uh, let's see, where, was it, where should I start? Conceived as a distraction, this book immediately took on the distracted character of that from which it was intended to be a distraction, namely myself. If I said to myself, if I can apply myself to a if I said to myself, if I can apply myself to a sober, I can remember saying that word sober to myself over and over until it acquired a hysterical near demented ring. If I can apply myself to a sober academic study of D.H. Lawrence, then that'll force me to put myself together. 
I succeeded in applying myself, but what I applied myself to, or so it seems to me now, now that I am lost in the middle of what is already a far cry from the sober academic study I had envisioned, was to pulling apart the thing, the book that was intended to make me pull myself together. And that's totally a Jeff Dyer kind of ramble. Uh, you either love this kind of stuff or you hate it. I kind of love it. He ends up spending the first 30 pages of the book describing trying to get out of a, a, rental, a rental agreement. And he spends most of the book avoiding writing about Lawrence and somehow manages to write a, an amazing book about Lawrence. Um, he ends up only looking at the photographs and the letters of Lawrence and really doesn't go back to any of the major books. Um, but in doing so, he really, he, he writes this incredible kind of investigation of what Lawrence is to him and what Lawrence is as a writer. But really the photographs become a kind of accompanying, even though he doesn't share the photographs, he uses them and describes them to you throughout the book. And I think of that, of that move, which makes it very, a hybrid type uh, impulse. Whereas if next slide, uh, I think, imagine many of you have read um, Citizen. Can we get a show of hands? Let's get a sense of who has. We got one, couple. Yeah. Um, if you haven't, I recommend it. It's an incredible book. It's more and more pertinent as we go along um, in some ways. But it is, um, it, she goes further than Jeff Dyer in the sense that she um, brings in other, the visual work onto, into the book and she collaborates with other artists throughout the book. Um, and I did a little bit of creative whiting out. I whited out some of the text above that photograph because I wanted you just to get a, a simple sense of the way she has these short prose poem, kind of lyric prose pieces next to, not always, but often next to photographs. And if you can look carefully, that street is called Jim Crow Street or C Jim Crow Court. So there's that kind of that uh, awful irony there. But she, the book is really, a large portion of the book are these little sections of second person, hey, Lola, quiet. I have a, a very needy dog here. Um, these kind of short, uh, really in a sense, partly descriptions of microaggressions and partly memories of encounters with other people that are, the second person allows her to write about her own experience, but you also realize, and she's talked about this in interviews, it's not just her, she's actually collaborating with other voices, that second person, or stories she's been told from other from other friends, other black folk who've experienced some of the things that she's experienced. And so she's she's bringing those to the page in a kind of communal, it's not we, but it's but that second person allows other voices to come in to join her voice. And I'll just read you this here. Certain moments send adrenaline to the heart, dry out the tongue and clog the lungs. Like thunder, they drown you in sound. No, like lightning, they strike you across the larynx. Cough. After it happened, I was at a loss for words. Haven't you said this yourself? Haven't you said this to a close friend who early in your friendship, when distracted, would call you by the name of her black housekeeper? You assumed you, were, you two were the only black people in her life. Eventually she stopped doing this, though she never acknowledged her slippage and you never called her on it, why not? And yet you don't forget that this were a domestic tragedy and it might well be, this would be your fatal flaw, your memory, vessel of your feelings. Do you feel hurt? because it's the all the black people look the same moment or because you are being confused with another after being so close to this other. Beautiful investigation throughout these pieces, but she also writes a, an essay that she uh, about um, Serena Williams and the racism that she faces. She, uh, if you don't mind, Glenn, turning the page. She uses a lot of art from uh, contemporary artists to just literally just um, showcases their work so that it becomes another, um, a whole other vehicle of, of expression that almost, you know, these pieces almost become like prose poems themselves. And that's a you know, beautiful photo montage um, that, and she uses the spread of the page very graphically. And this idea of a book as a, as a, as a show or a museum exhibit, um, the whole experience of the book is, is different. And I think it's, the hybrid form is what creates that. Um, and then the next page is another artist doing a great uh, graphic, um, kind of devastating graphic representation of two different phrases. Um, we'll get there in a sec. 
Yeah, I do not always feel colored. I do not always feel colored. I do not always feel colored. And then on the other side of the page, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. And, that, and then the way that text blurs, you know, it just, there's a, um, a whole other thing going on here that's, that's it's, it's literary and it's, it's um, text, but it's also text as image. And she's playing up her own work against these pieces. Um, I want to just give you a quick description by, um, I think a beautiful analysis of this book by Mary Jean Chan in um, a piece called Towards the Poetics of Racial Trauma. She says, I contend that sin is a work that extends the lyrics possibility through creating a hybrid text containing lyric essays, photography, public art, and video scripts, which are juxtaposed for intertextual and polyphonic effects. I argue that Rankin uses lyric hybridity to create a poetics of racial trauma that mediates on the effects of racial injustice as it manifests in the bodies of traumatized individuals. Lyric hybridity appears crucial to Rankin's project since it allows for complex subjectivity and intimate address amidst a clarity of language that enables the reader to perceive how we could easily fall, fail one another in our daily pursuit of rationality, re relationality and community. Um, kind of heady stuff, but I think she's got a, this idea of a lyric hybridity and this idea of bringing other voices in is the key. Um, I think I'm gonna skip the next piece um, or skip over it pretty quickly so we have enough time. But the third way that I think you can approach a hybrid text is to very consciously fuse forms or to what I call dramatize your research um, so that the process of the writing becomes part of the final form. Um, do you mind jumping forward, Glenn? Thank you so much. I appreciate this. One last uh, Jeff Dyer introduction. He writes, um, like my earlier blockbuster yoga for people who can't be bothered to do it, this book is a mixture of fiction and nonfiction. What's the difference? And then he goes on to explain, um, really, that he just changes the names. But he has a beautiful question at the end there, and I'll just read it to you. I think we jumped forward one. But the main point is that the book does not demand to be read according to how far from, how, you know, basically, I don't want to overdo this, but he wants to blur the line between fiction and nonfiction, and he does it to comic effect. This writer, Sarah Centiles, is a very serious writer. It's a book that I recommend um, highly, but she's basically trying to look at photography to get at uh, war and, uh, and drones and the power and the, the devastating um, effect of, of technological warfare. It's, it sounds like um, dark, it is a dark book, but it's also a beautiful book. She, she melds memoir and um, kind of philosophy and reportage and critical theory all kind of together in a, in a, in a, in a collage. I don't know if you guys have read much Maggie Nelson or um, Sarah Maguso's 300 Arguments or some of the Annie Dillard's work where you get a kind of quilt of, of, of paragraphs. If you just jump one more page, I can show you. All right. Um, yeah, if you yeah you can look here. Um, just miss some of it's missing, but there's a, a, a yeah there's a single uh, quote from Ansel Adams. There's a a um, bit of history there about the internment camps. There's a little bit of uh, reportage about doing some research um, about where the internment camp all the parts of it that when they, they when they cleared it out, they gave some buildings to different hospitals. And then she tells a little bit of a story, a memoirish kind of story at the end there. It's, it's all woven together in a kind of uh, collage nest in a way. And she's getting at these, these ideas kind of in a circular fashion. Uh, and you can tell that she's kind of working it out as she goes. Um, okay, I wanna do one last thing. Um, and I'm, I know this is a lot of stuff at once, but I wanted to get it out there so then we can have some discussion and maybe even do an exercise. Um, I wanted to, to end these examples with uh, this new book that I'm that I just finished, Beyond Repair, Living in a Fractured State. And, and in a lot of ways, the book is a sequel or, or it comes out of uh, the, the first book, Beginner's Guide. It describes, um, uh, it, whereas Beginner's Guide ends about four years after the accident, um, Beyond Repair takes me and the reader four years uh, further. 
uh, up to about 2018, early 2019. And it really describes um, struggling with PTSD and trying to um, find ways to encounter people in a way that would be uh, that would deepen my experience and, and give me a sense of, of a new sense of belonging that I had lost um, by being so hurt and being so kind of uh, not so much of a hermit for so many years. Um, what I found was that piece that I wrote, sh shared with you briefly or talked about changes where I was dr driving along and, and encountering these people on the street. I began to realize that I, I kept writing those pieces. And I didn't know why. And so for a couple of years, I'd be just writing down encounters. I just, there's a, um, Glenn, if you don't mind going to one more page, I'm not going to read it, but there's a piece here where I, I'm walking, I, I run into a woman who has Alzheimer's and I barely have a, a, I'm barely able to understand her situation, partly because it's hard to read somebody coming out of an elevator, but partly it was because I was so wrapped up in my own head that I, I didn't really understand what was going on, but something about her gave me a sense of, I needed to help this person. And that encounter, um, a light went on my head. It was like, oh, you, you don't, you're not paying attention. Um, and so I began to, to watch myself in the world and I began to have these encounters with people um, much like citizen in a way, coming from a different side point of view, but I began to see, um, my encounters with other white people here. I live in the South, up in the mountains of Nashville. There was, and there was a kind of class thing going on. I was beginning to see that there was this kind of PTSD going on in the world around me. And I couldn't tell if it was, I was instigating it because I was so triggered or if people around me were so triggered because of what was going on in the world or some kind of combination. But I began to try to capture those moments. And so this book is a series of encounters. Um, and I, but I also was taking photographs and I'd been started to read about uh, anti-racism and white privilege, which so many people are doing now. Um, I think we were all a little bit late, but it's you know it's good to start somewhere. And so quotes from those books started to filter into the book, not so much into the essays, but um, but more into the kind of interstitially. And I began to put um, headlines from all the different headlines for the last four of those four years, and so many unarmed black men were being shot and kids and women and so many mass shootings were going on. It was, you know, we were all so bombarded by it. Those headlines started to come in. And so again, a kind of weave of text began to form themselves. And I did my best to kind of put them together into this, um, what I see as a kind of collage. Um, and Let's one more. I think did we jump over? I kind of did it backwards. There's a slide that's just text, um, like type text. Is it before this one or yeah, that one? Sorry. I wanted to um, share with you something that my friend, the poet Vivi Francis, wrote to me just recently in an email. She said I she said I could, and this is a way to kind of end this long diatribe here. Um, I think this is a statement that really embodies the, the, the mindset or the heart set in a way of true um, openness to hybridity, even though she really is such a strong um, lyric poet. She writes, did you know I write, it with, I write without thinking of who's watching or listening or looking over my shoulder? In this way, I utterly disagree with Bloom. Not all of us have the anxiety of influence. My anxiety rests in other areas. When I write, there is no one there but me. No coconical poet's judgment, no ingenue's judgment. I'm having a conversation with myself or in parody with the great dead, but I still, I feel still calm inside my mind, in my mind, even as my heart races because the words are rushing at me while I'm taking a long ladle and trying to get into that damned well within me. Such a beautiful way to put it. Uh, I think of the idea of the canon uh, as being created by the individual's internalized library, this idea that she has her conversation in her, in her head with these great artists and who a great artist is, is up to her. And, and that conversation um, is what is feeding her, not so much looking around her um, and, and comparing herself um, or, you know, being anxious um, the way that uh, both Bloom and what T.S. Eliot kind of get into. Um, well, that's that, and I wanted to, um, and I, I want to apologize for just kind of rattling it off, but I really wanted to get it out there. And I wondered if we could um, 
Glenn, just kind of open it up to the full screen and get the, the text out of there.